Do you see me? Says I'm live. Live now. Are you guys there? Oh, mm -hmm. good. Says I'm live. Hi, Luke. Live now. Oh, hi, Caleb. Hi, Piper. Hi, Logan. Oh, aliens exist. I don't know. Okay. Um, so, let's talk first about where we're headed. Because, uh, oh, that's not what I meant to do. Um, I feel like I told you guys that we were going to go to water. Oh, good. Oh, I can hear. Hi, Luke. Do you guys hear a feedback there? Hi, Taylor. Hi, Piper. Oh, do I, I need to turn you. this off? Oh, mm -hmm. and this, I don't know. Okay, that's better, right? That's better. Okay. Um. So we are headed to air pollution fresh off the press this weekend. They decided that you guys would not be tested over units. Eight and nine. So your AP exam is going to be um, units one through seven, which includes air pollution. And uh, and not water pollution. Um, so that it leaves out. You can look up on AP Central. You guys, I'll have your things. So unit nine is global change. Unit 8 is aquatic and terrestrial pollution. So the last one is air pollution. And that's what we're going to go over. And then I'm going to swing back around. And I'm going to pick up some more on energy. Because that's going to be on there. So I'm going to just look and see what unit I'm going to create next for energy. Because we don't need to do climate change or water pollution. So we'll just see where we go to next. Um, your test is going to be 45 high Trevor. Your test is going to be 45 questions, and it looks like it's going to be what they're calling short answer. And that scares me, because uh, that sounds like it's just a lot of writing. Um, their words were, because you're going to take it at home, it's going to be something that you can't look up on Google, and you can't, like, quit chat with a friend. I don't, I don't know. Um, <laughs> like we're all going to take it in a circle and we're all going to like scream out the answers or something. I don't know, guys. Um, I just know that these aren't, but these are times that are different and that's, that's, that's what we're doing. You're going to just write a lot for AP Environmental. And remember, they're just looking for kids that have actually taken the course. And so you guys are going to, oh, hi, Tommy. Um, you guys are going to, oh, and there's Logan and Kaylee. Sorry, I blinked. Um, so you guys are going to learn a lot about air pollution in this chapter, and that's going to help. And then, like I said, we're going to swing back around, and we're going to pick up some more stuff, and everything's going to be okay. They've kicked me out of the school, so this is my home. Welcome. And uh, I don't know that Chad and Ace won't be making an appearance, or that Rosie won't be making an appearance, but... If they do, we'll swing through it. Chad dropped my microphone when we were moving everything out, so I hope it's still working. Um, let's see what else. Okay, the test. Sounds like there's two to four questions that I need to look at, and I'll do that. Again, you guys kind of freak out, and it's okay, but be, be calm. Um, there'll still be a curve. It's going in as a quiz grade, not a test grade. Sounds like I put two questions on there that were, um, that didn't have a right answer, like I just didn't select a right answer, so like every answer was wrong. And then it sounds like there was two questions that I need to look at the answer that was selected. Um, will we get to do chapter eight? I don't know, maybe, what's chapter eight? Um, so, good, thank you, Caleb. Um, so I'll take a look at that. And you guys will get the curve. It'll be fine. Everything's going to be all right. I think we're all seeing the difference in um, what it's like to be together and how much work it is when we're apart. And so um, hopefully you guys are fine-tuning 
your relationship with your AP Environmental textbook and these videos and me. And um, Kaylee says two were wrong on mine and that's it. Okay, so good. Um, so I'll figure that out for you guys and I'll get that in soon, hopefully today. No, Carly, we're not going to do Chapter 17 because that's water pollution, and it's that's Unit 8, and they're not going to do Unit 7 or 8 on your AP exam. So it's Units 1 through 7 on AP Central. So you go to a AP Central, and good morning, Avocado69, and um, you look at Units 1 through 7, and those... Um, Papers that I ran off for you guys and said we're covering this and this and this. I don't know. I may take snapshots and upload them. I may look at AP Central and see if you guys can't just see them from there. But you're just going through and making sure that you've hit units 1 through 7 on AP Central. Units 1 through 7. Okay. Um, so today, what I want to do is I think what I'd like to try to do is get through... Chapter 18, section 18-1 and 18-2, because 18-1 is nothing. Um, I think it's just like this is the atmosphere, and so that's going to be very quick. But 18-2 um, goes all the way to 58, so I don't know if we'll get that far. But we'll get as far as we get, and, um, you know, we'll do what we can. So this is air pollution. So 18-1 is what's the nature of the atmosphere. So there's two things that or the, the two layers that they really want you to know are the troposphere and the stratosphere. And the tra and I feel like we've done this before, right? <laughs> oh, hey, Cohen. Um, so I feel like we've already talked about the troposphere and the stratospheres once, but I've taught this class a couple of times, so I could be wrong. Um, but the big things that you need to know is that the troposphere, which is where we are living, and then the stratosphere has our ozone. Okay, yes, we have talked about it good. So, I love this picture because it kind of gives you that, that bend um, of the earth, and then it also gives you that look of all of those different layers. I don't know if I would want to go to outer space. Like, there's a part of me that says I would definitely want to go to outer space and check it out and float around. And then there's a part of me that when I get up high, like, my butt tingles, y'all. And I, I don't like it. Like, I think about, oh, <laughs> hello to your chihuahua. So, um, there was uh, The Kingsman. Oh, that's a great show. Where there's this chick and she's flying up on this, uh, I don't know, like a standing platform. And she's going up through the layers of the atmosphere and she's going to have to bail off. Guys, I feel like I would just die clinging to that pole and be like, I'm not jumping off. I, I don't know. Um, so, enough of that. It is a thin layer of gases. It's called the atmosphere. And I picked this picture because um, it illustrates that there are, you know, the mesosphere, the thermosphere. We have different layers. I also like that this is in miles because we're American and we don't do it right. Um, and there are certain misconceptions about the atmosphere that I think that, that this chart or graph kind of helps you illustrate. So the higher pressure is located closer to the, to the ground and the lower pressure is as you go up high. And I think some people get that confused. Um, because your ears pop, my ears, oh, they hurt so bad when I fly. Um, <laughs> oh, Reagan, tell your sisters I said hi. Um, so, cool thing, though, if you snort afrin when you fly, so you take a nasal decongestant, and then you snort that afrin, that, that nasal decongestant, right before you fly, it helps the pain in your ears, because you have this tympanic membrane, and it's inside your ear, right? And so it's that pulling on that tympanic membrane that hurts in that change of pressure. So some of you can fix this pain by chewing gum or swallowing, or you're not supposed to do the plug your nose and blow thing, but some of you do that. Um, mine is so bad, so bad. So I, of course, do drugs, and, and it helps a tremendous amount. And again, when we're flying, we are not, 
going through the layers of the atmosphere. We are staying in our troposphere at the act of flight. So one of the things that we, um, oh, that's true. So one of the things that we're looking at is, um, remember, in your in your mind's eye, you see the tiny bubbles, right? And so I love that this air molecule shows the tiny bubbles. So the more dense it is, the more bubbles it has. Those are your air molecules. And so as you go through the layers, you end up with more spaced out bubbles, less pressure. Um, also, when we talk about temperature, right? And we I think we all know we saw, you know, like Guardians of the Galaxy 1 and 2 because they're both good. And, uh, you know, you freeze when you're out of space or, oh, my gosh, there was the Star Wars one where, like, uh, Princess Leia, she's, like, flying through space and she's freezing, but she somehow doesn't die. I think it's the force. I don't know. Um, so, density. The number of gas molecules per unit of air volume varies throughout the atmosphere because gravity pulls as gas uh, pulls its gas molecules towards the Earth's surface. So. I think we all know 9.8 meters per second squared squared. Um, and that's pretty much standard. Oh, look, this is us in Colorado. Isn't that cool? Oh, I miss that. Um, so this means that lower layers have more gases, more weight than the upper layers do. And they are more densely packed. So if you have had the opportunity to go to a place like Colorado or the Smokies in Tennessee, some of you, I mean, my ears pop when I just drive across the state of Kentucky. So, you know, that's that's that tympanic membrane that's reacting to that. <laughs> um, so the air that we breathe at sea level has the higher has a higher density than the air we would inhale on top of a mountain. So just in that little bit of difference, you can see. Now, it doesn't. I don't know. Nine point eight. Yep. And um, if you look at this picture, when you see how high up you really are, those are tiny little cars that are behind my head there. Um, so it's pretty high up. I mean, the air was pretty thin up there. There's Ace. He climbed all the way up this. He was uh, climbing with these college kids, and he climbed all the way to the top, and he got to ring the bell. It was super cool. I was really proud of him. Um, so this is the reason why you feel more short of breath. Uh, more quickly in these mountainous places. <laughs> and uh, this is another reason why when you see NFL teams go and play Denver, they'll, they'll have those oxygen masks on the sidelines. It's because Denver has, I, evidently that's, um, so that's my bell that says somebody's coming in and out of my house, and then that's Rosie that you hear. Um, so, Sorry, I digress. They put the oxygen mask on because Denver, you know, they call it the Mile High City. So they're accustomed to breathing air that is thinner than what we are. So when they come down to visit us, then they're like drunk on our oxygen. And when we go visit them, it is amazing how quickly you feel out of breath. Um, yes, there are great runners that train in the mountains. And... Um, that's why BYU is such good runners. Oh, I'm sure. And I, I feel like our don't cross-country people, don't we go to camp in a mountainous type place? I feel like. Okay, another important atmospheric variable is the pressure that we're talking about. And this will decrease with atmosphere. And we're going to try to watch our video together today. Hopefully that I'm out of the building. It'll be good. Gatlinburg.
All right, so you guys can't hear it? That's awesome. It's fine. Look, it's fine. It's all part of this sweet little journey that we're on, right? Um, maybe Emily can figure out why we can't hear it. <laughs> and she will let me know later. All right, so. It was sad. It was silent. Hey, Max. Uh, yeah. <laughs> all right i'm moving on uh, i hope y'all watch my videos later all right so air movements in the troposphere play a key role in the earth's weather and climate now i'm not a weather and climate girl there are people that love to talk about the weather they love to watch the weather show the weather channels the whatever i'm just not one of them um so about 75 to 80 percent of the earth's air mass is found in the troposphere which is our layer, right? You've got to understand that that's our layer. Um, we have about 11 miles. Remember, on OBS is your audio output enabled. I don't know. Let's take a look. And where is that under? I can hear Ace whispering. That's how good this microphone is. Okay. That's... Okay. OBS. Do you all see audio? I mean, my microphone's on this time at least. Is it dug on her settings? Audio. Output. I mean, I haven't touched anything. Okay, let's just get back to lecture. Matthew Hendricks sources. Setting sources? Or was there a thing for sources? <laughs> I didn't see it. At the bottom it said sources and audio. Okay. <laughs> uh, I didn't but I didn't change anything. like the bottom of my computer on the main screen you were just on oh stop it there's an I and a one. no <laughs> Okay, I'm here now. I'll be still for just a minute. Oh, there's an eye on the lock. I see it. Yeah, okay. The audio mixer. Okay, yeah. Yeah. Where are the green bars moving? Yeah, I see it. Am I supposed to do something? 
Miss out the cover. Okay, what am I supposed to do now? <laughs> They're gonna pass this <laughs> for what not to do. Yeah, what do I do now? Uh, oh, I don't know. I just saw it. I'm just being still. That's where it should be, probably. Oh. Go to the little gear. Audio output capture. <laughs> you guys, I can't. Scroll down. It is down. Make sure none are muted. Okay. Great. We're at <laughs> Alright, I'm just going to wait a couple more minutes. Yes, I agree, Matthew. <laughs> Alright, let's go. I forgot how to get off this page. <laughs> Remember, this is uh, this slide is also talking to you about <sighs> the Earth is an oblate spheroid, meaning that it kind of looks like Eric Cartman's head, right? So it's wider at the equator and shorter at the top. All right, so if you were to go to Walmart and you were ask a hundred people what is the atmosphere made out of, they would say oxygen, like a hundred percent. So. The number one gas is nitrogen. I think, <laughs> I think this is, um, I think that, I don't think that's going to be like on the test is what's the number one gas in the atmosphere, but it's important that you know. Nitrogen and oxygen are the two primary components, and then from that it gets very, very, very um, thin, right, very not a lot of a lot of other things, mostly nitrogen and oxygen. So, rising and falling of air currents, winds, and concentration of carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases in the top and the troposphere play a major role in the difference between weather and climate. So, you do need to be able to accurately talk to somebody about the difference between weather and climate. So, weather is what it is right now like the weather today i feel like it's beautiful it's sunny it's a little cool but it's not exceptionally cool i feel like it's in the 50s and then um thank you matthew um and then climate is like an overall view of what is happening in this region so it's the average weather usually they have um like consumed a ton of information like your book says three decades to determine what the climate is for an area so like our climate is hot and humid in the summers and then um i would say mild to moderate winters right sometimes we get a pretty righteous winter every now and then but typically our winters aren't bad so the stratosphere the major thing you need to know about our stratosphere is that this is where we find our ozone that is the a number one most important thing about the stratosphere 
So after you get past the mile marker 11, you get into the stratosphere and it has um, O3, which is your ozone. And then its volume of water is one one thousandth. So not a lot of water, ton, 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 ton of ozone. And we're going to learn the difference between good ozone and bad ozone. So um, I just picked this image because you're kind of getting to see, like, see, there's our plane staying in the troposphere. Um, air temperature does decrease with height, which we just talked about earlier. And then your ultraviolet radiation is absorbed using the ozone. So if we didn't have our ozone, um, you know, there's, there's a lot of questions like, What's going to happen if we don't have our ozone? Well, my, I mean, like, the primary answer is if we don't have an ozone, we're, you know, we're not going to be outside much at all. But the answer is so much more complex when you consider um, chlorophyll A, chlorophyll B, photosynthesis. What, what you know, what, what's going to do to our, it always goes back to the producers, right? So, I mean, it's not just about us and what would it do to skin cancer, because I think that's where our minds immediately go. But it's all organisms, not just us. Um, so this is good. I'm glad this was on here because I was just thinking to myself, gosh, if I were in the classroom right now, I would be drawing O3 and I would be like circling it and saying, this is what ozone looks like. So this is good. Um, so this is how we actually disrupt an oxygen, like an O2 molecule, and we create an O3 molecule. And inversely, like, so the top row, you're seeing, you've got your O2 molecule, and we've got, it splits, right? So now we have free floating oxygen. But remember, oxygen has six valence electrons in its outer shell. And the magic number is eight. That's right. I'm sure somebody just said it. And um, so it's looking for those other two. Um, so it ends up in this covalent bond with your other, you know, like you're, you're, you've got your free floating out there and we're all looking for the eight so then the three come together and they covalently they share so that they all kind of feel like they've got eight in their outer electron shell their outer energy level um so uv radiation strikes o2 releases it free floating oxygen's hanging out o2 molecule grabs it makes o3 now we have an ozone molecule so this sounds good. We love ozone. We love not dying from UV radiation poisoning. Um, lightning can create, right? So it can, you know, remember, these bonds are strong. So not just anything can just knock it off. Good. Um, so we want ozone. We just don't want ozone hanging around at the ground level. Uh, this is my umbrella. So Chad got me this umbrella when we, uh, I don't know, 18th wedding anniversary, I think. I love eggs, y'all. Um, and so this was probably more expensive than any umbrella should have been. But I love it so much. Um, so UV filtering effects of the ozone in the lower stratosphere allows us and other life forms on land to exist. It, it protects us from some burns. Skin cancer, eye cancer, that's why you can go by Ray-Bans at your optimo ophthalmologist, Optom optometrist, <laughs> ophthalmologist, what is that? Optometrist, is an ophthalmologist just the surgeon? Eggs are delicious. Um, cataracts, the damage to our immune system, that's falling more into like prolonged damage. Um, okay, I'm going to hit the button. We're going to see what happens. We're not going to fall into this hole. Okay, hang on. I just had a thought. No? Okay. So mine is turned all the way up. Okay, can you hear it? All right, so I have to find out. Okay. I don't understand.
they're saying. I'm sure there's something I'm missing. Okay. So, this is just talking about the effects. I was reading a comic where... Oh, God. Okay. Oh, that's not what I want. All right. So, I'm going to say this is 18-2. So, what are the major outdoor air pollution problems? So, first things first. Remember, what can be a pollutant? Anything. Anything can be a pollutant. So, pollutants mix in the air to form industrial smog, primary as a result of burning, uh, burning fossil fuels such as coal, and to form photochemical fo smog caused by emissions from motor vehicles, industrial facilities, and power plants. Um, so... Air pollution comes from natural as well as human sources. It can be anything. It is the presence of chemicals in the atmosphere. So anything that can get up in the atmosphere could be considered a pollutant if it can do enough harm. So any chemical can become a pollutant on any range from just an annoyance to lethal. I, um, we're not supposed to burn leaves and some of you guys well, we're not supposed to burn anything here in Spring Bank, but um, some of you guys like the smell of burning leaves. I loathe the smell of smoke. I I don't like it. I don't like it on my clothes. Like, if I were to go, like, the campfire smell, I hate it. Um, if I were to go to a campfire-type gathering, I, everything on my body would come off, bath, everything's washed. Like, I don't even want it in the house we go straight to the laundry room and everything goes in there. Um, so, oh, the dose makes the poison. So this is kind of one of those sayings for AP Environmental that's important that you're going to hear over and over and over and over. So the dose makes the poison. So it's not that necessarily things are bad. It's in what quantities are they? So I kind of got on this cool little kick of things that you use every day that are actually can be considered toxic. So if you eat toothpaste, it can be toxic. So, um, oh, and Nora, your dad would love this. How many tubes of toothpaste is considered toxic? 33. I don't know anybody who's going to eat 33 tubes of toothpaste in a setting. That would be very bad. 78 shots of espresso would pretty much take you down, right? Fatal caffeine overdoses in adults are relatively rare and require ingestions of large quantities in excess of 5,000 milligrams. So, espresso has 64, right? So, natural sources of air pollutants are also in things that you would be Yes, things that would, you would expect, like a big volcanic eruption. That would be tons of air pollutants. You can't be around that. Um, I know that in Hawaii, with the uh, the lava flows, you know, they're, they're trying to keep everybody away from that because of its pollutants. So wildfires, volcanic eruptions, wind, dust in the winds, volatile organic chemicals. So these are the VOCs. We talked a little bit about um, are the plants trying to kill you? And the short answer is no. The long answer is they do release volatile. Oh my gosh, Miss Agglehart is calling. Can you see that? We're going to decline her. You know what? Let's put her on. Hi, Miss Agglehart. You're on speakerphone with Miss Gimme Horn's AP Environmental class. Oh my. <laughs> well, I'll call you back. <laughs> um, I'm sure they do not want to hear what I'm going to tell you about. Well, I'm sure they don't either, but I I know that um, that they miss you and they're enjoying hearing your voice. Okay. I so, miss them too. So you're up you're up to the microphone. So you can tell Hello them. Hello all. There you go. I'm alive. Uh, Caleb says, hi, Miss Agglehart. Uh, okay. <laughs> well, have fun teaching. You can call me later. All right. Talk to you soon. Bye. Bye. All right. So. Oh, there's a new island in Antarctica? I didn't know that. 
I will, I will do it, Trevor. I will point her to the chat and she can see all of the, um, she can see all the posts. So, most human inputs of outdoor air pollutants occur in industrialized and urban areas where people's cars, factories are all concentrated. So, if you look at this picture, you might not at first identify what you're looking at, but this is our riverfront, right? This is fancy schmancy Owensboro, Kentucky. So, the answer is always going to be burning of fossil fuels. When you're talking about pollution, they are probably wanting you to come back to the demonic human uh, interference, right? Because we know what the course is and we know what they're looking for. Um, technology is available to reduce such air pollution. Prevention is always better than... Um, what am I looking for? What am I looking for? Prevention is better than, like, clean, the cleanup, but it usually costs so much to prevent, to go in and intercede, that we end up just trying to, to clean up, to clean up, to clean up. Um, when you think about the car emissions, right? So, all of the new cars, lower emissions, lower emissions, lower emissions. Well, if you go back in time 20 years, let's see. So, when Chad and I got married... He bought me this blue Impala, and I thought I was the coolest person on the planet. And it had one of those big, like, bench seats, and I loved it so much. And uh, I, I want to say we got the car for, I don't know, $6,000, maybe $8,000. Like, it wasn't much. It was clearly a used car, uh, but it wasn't very expensive. And I don't even know. Like, well, you clearly can't buy a new car for six or $8,000 now. Like, not even a, like, a little bitty one. Okay. Matthew, was the 25 short answer thing the AP exam or the prep? Uh, 45 short answer thing. And it's the eight, it's going to be your AP exam. is 45 short answer questions. Yep. That's it. Um, some pollutants in the atmosphere combine to form other pollutants. So, this one's going to be easy. You're going to have to know these for your test. The difference between a primary pollutant and a secondary pollutant. So, if it is a primary pollutant, it is a chemical or a substance that is emitted directly into the air from natural processes and human activities at concentrations high enough to cause harm. So, that's primary. Secondary, guess what's going to happen? While in the atmosphere, the primary pollutants react with one another or with something else, and they become secondary pollutants. So primaries get together and become secondaries, which is what you guys know. I know. All right. This is not Owensboro. So urban areas have higher concentration of air pollutants, but winds will spread these pollutants to surrounding rural areas. So, um, Dear God, you guys got to focus. So I've already talked about the AP exam. We'll maybe talk about it again at the end. Okay, so urban areas. Oh, so dilution is the solution for pollution, right? Um, dilution is the solution for pollution. So if you can, anything, dilute anything. That's why um, pollutants in the water Typically, like out in the ocean, it's not that big of a deal because the ocean is so vast. The ocean is so mighty that it can pollute, the pollutants become diluted pretty quickly. Um, same idea with a fart. You know, if somebody farts and you're literally sitting next to them, it's probably not going to go well for you. But if you're all the way across the room, you might not even know somebody farted because although the fart molecules are still there, it dilutes as it crosses the room like you're going to eventually smell that fart but um long-lived pollutants enter the atmosphere in india and china and we know 1.4 bill 1.4 bill but now there's so many people <laughs> i mean there was um and they're making their way up. it's literally making its way across the ocean so this is arctic haze which is um uh, you know, we don't have people in the Arctic, so you wouldn't expect to find air pollutants there, and yet somehow. Um, so, carbon monoxide is one of, <laughs> is one of the things that we uh, are 
pretty knowledgeable on now. I can remember when carbon monoxide became a thing. And if I were in class, I would tell you that there, you know, it, I don't even know how many families, but there was, for instance, there was a family who woke up dead. And then it's kind of like a test to see what kid's going to be like, wait, you woke up dead? Dude, you're not dead. If you woke up dead, yes, thank you. You woke up dead. Um, so carbon monoxide poisoning is something that if you have, like we have ADT, so it's constantly monitoring our carbon monoxide levels in our house. Uh, when we had the, the great freeze of whatever year that was, 2009, 2008, um, however old you guys were. Um, so, people put their generators in their houses, like those big rah, 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 generators, and um, they also woke up dead because of carbon monoxide poisoning. So, anything that is, oh, that thing on the right that has the little grade on the front of it, that's what Ace touched. You guys remember me telling you a story about Ace touching that screen and it frying his little hand. Oh my gosh, when we were building our new house, I could still hear the sizzle of his little hand. I was so bad. It had, it was turned off. We didn't know that, that they had just left and they turned this heater off. And Ace, you know, I don't know, somewhere between like, like one and a half, two years old, walked up and touched the grate. And like, you just heard the kss of his hand and oh, it was so bad. So the scary thing about carbon monoxide is uh, we, we get it from combustions, right? Combustion reactions, so things that are burning, but it is colorless and it is odorless. So it kind of just, uh, I think sometimes you may feel like you have a headache. I don't know. I don't, hopefully I've never had carbon monoxide poisoning, but most of the time the families don't know, right? They go to bed. They think everything is fine carbon monoxide is too high in their house and they just don't wake up. Um, so motor vehicle exhaust. Some of you guys have heard of people trying to commit suicide by, by, you know, the car in the garage. This is why if you stay in your car, it's not like if you, <laughs> there was once where we closed the garage door and, uh, I was still talking on the phone, and I guess Ace had just found out about this, and he was like, open the garage door, we're all going to die, and I'm like, it doesn't happen that quickly, um, so it's not immediate, but that that's why if you're in your garage, you want to leave the door at least slightly raised to allow exhaust to get in and out, um, but again, you'll notice all of these things are fire, 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 um, so the hemoglobin in your blood is is what is affected and so see these are some of the things that you would experience carbon dioxide is good right it's a byproduct it helps with photosynthesis which hopefully we all remember um this would be a part of our biogeochemical cycles we produce carbon dioxide it is also colorless and odorless and 93 percent from natural carbon cycle uh yeah from natural carbon cycles. It, uh, the rest comes from human activities. It recently has been considered a pollutant because we were putting more in the atmosphere than the carbon cycle can handle. So remember, inputs, throughputs, outputs, right? As far as carbon dioxide, carbon monoxide, all of that is with our carbon cycle. So nitric oxide. This is when nitrogen and oxygen react. And a lot of times nitric oxide comes from coal. So we get into dirty coal, clean coal. Kentucky is, you know, that we are in coal country. So this uh, infographic that I've put in there with you is kind of showing you how much, like clearly we were, looks like the biggest in 1995. And then those numbers have gradually gone down. Of course, we also know what has happened to our coal plants. Um, from 1995 to 2008. So lightning and certain bacteria also produce it and the nitrogen cycle helps deal with these outputs. So I found this, I didn't realize these are all the different colors in the air. Nitrogen oxide or nitric oxide reacts with um, 
So NO reacts with oxygen form nitrogen dioxide, which is a reddish-brown gas. So if you look at the NO2, that's what it looks like. So you see when we have smog, when we have that brown look in the air, that it's, that's scary. If you can see it, it's scary. So collectively, NO and NO2 are called nitrogen oxides, which is just hyphenated as NOx. I am not interested in you guys knowing all of these different chemical compounds, all these different chemical formulas. I don't think AP is interested in you knowing them all as well. Um, I can remember when I was typing all this up, I thought, how in the world are they going to keep all of this in their head? My answer is you're not. Um, or again, yeah, good for you. So some of the NO2 reacts with water vapor in the air and they form nitric acids. Some of them reacts with the air and forms nitric salts. Um, and ultimately, it can lead to acid deposition, um, which is acid rain. Uh, and if it has a pH, so remember, let's go back real quickly. pH scale, 0, 14. 7 is neutral. So 0 to 7 are acids. They have hydrogen ions. 7 to 14 are bases or alkaline. They have hydroxide, OH, with the little dash, right? Negative. Um, so if you are at a 5.6, uh, that's pretty acidic. I mean, it's not like you're going to walk outside and sizzle, but it's by the power of 10, right? So every time you go down the pH scale, you go from 10 to 100 to 1,000. Um, so acid deposition consists of rain, snow, dust, or gas with a pH lower than 5.6 not going to sizzle. This makes me very sad. This is photochemical smog, and I think this is what they're just used to seeing, and I think that we don't appreciate looking outside and seeing what we see. Um, it's very beautiful, and this would make me very sad, and I feel like that would be all over you all the time. At high enough levels, nitrogen oxides can irritate the eyes, the nose, the throat, aggravate your lungs, suppress plant growth, reduce visibility. I don't understand why there's not just a huge movement to plant trees everywhere there, but I don't live there, so you know it's LA. Sulfur dioxide and sulfuric acid. Here's what I got to say about this. Sulfur smells like rotten eggs, and it looks yellow, and we're not going to really focus a lot on this. I feel sorry for this man. This looks like a terrible job. I hope he's getting paid very, very well. Um, sulfur dioxide is a colorless gas. That irritating odor is, yep, that's bad. Um, and a third of the sulfur dioxide in the atmosphere is going to come from natural sources like the sulfur cycle. So remember, I keep going back to these biogeochemical cycles that we've already learned. And here it is burning fossil fuels. So please tell me that you're putting that burning fossil fuels in your back pocket because that's where all this is coming from. An aerosol. Now, when I say, what is an aerosol? 99.98% of you guys are going to think of an aerosol can, and that's absolutely appropriate. That's what it is. In the atmosphere, sulfur dioxide can be converted to an aerosol, which is just microscopic droplets that are suspended. So, it's any suspension of a particle. So, when we start talking about it's an aerosol in our heads, we're seeing this, or I'm seeing this. Like, when they, when they were talking about these are aerosols in the atmosphere, I was like, who's got that on can of, like, Aquanet spraying this crap in the air? I, you know, that sounds terrible. No, no. No, no. So, I go down, I talk to Miss Koshi, and I'm like, what is the deal with this? And she's like, oh, it can be any suspension of particles. Like, all of those things are, oh, no, that's funny. Can you all hear that? Oh, that was Chad running the sink, or somebody's running the sink. Um, but as soon as I turned on the slide with the, with the rain, that noise came. That's funny. Um, so pretty much every particle that we're going to cover can be considered an aerosol. If it is matter that's suspended in the air, it's an aerosol. Um, this is cool. This is evidently what happens in the valleys of the, um, in like a mountainous range where you can see the clouds kind of rolling through. I've never seen this uh, in real life, but I think I would like to. 
um, aerosols can form naturally when pine trees release a chemical called alpha panini. I thought panini was just a bread, uh, but that evidently is not. It is an oil that condenses into particles that can be suspended as a haze. So the Smoky Mountains have this. You don't have to know the, and I don't even know if it's alpha panini. I, you know, I just make stuff up. But um, that's where the Smoky Mountains got their name is because of this pine tree thing. Uh, those of you that watched the, watch the Walking Dead, you saw the whispers like tap into those pine trees and launch it and like set that stuff on fire. I don't know that that's solid science. I don't, I don't know about all that. Um, so we can have the sulfate, the sulfate salts that can create acid rain. And I really want you to look at these South Asian brown clouds. Like this is important that you watch this video. These brown clouds are the things that we're watching roll across to the United States. So, uh, you know, it ain't, a ba it ain't a big deal till it's in your backyard. Well, guess what, boys and girls? It is in your backyard. Now, you do also need to know the PM10 and PM2.5. So, when we are talking about micrometers, microns, holy moly. Like, guys, we are talking about such small, small matter. So, uh, if you'll look at the right-hand side here, one millimeter, which is one of the tiny little, right, spaces, is a thousand microns. So, tiny. So, one one thousandth of a millimeter, tiny, tiny, tiny. So if it is considered fine, it has a PM of, uh, diameter is less than 10 micrometers. And if it is, no, um, the brown clouds are, are being created in Asia. It's theirs. And they're, yes, it's coming across the oceans. That's how big they are and how dense they are. It's definitely not good. Um, so fine and ultra fine, you'll need to know the difference between the two on the test. About 62% of the suspended particulate matter in outdoor air comes from natural sources, such as dust, wind, uh, wildfires, sea salts. 38% comes from us. So 62% is already here. Uh, the sea salt stuff, I had no idea that that was a big deal. But evidently, that's a pretty big deal. All right, bad ozone. Let's talk about the bad ozone. There's good ozone and there's bad ozone. And the difference is the location, location, location. So if it gets trapped down in the troposphere where we are living and breathing, it's considered photochemical smog and it, it means to kill you, right? If it's up, in the stratosphere, it is sunblock, it is good, it is our little insulation blanket, whatever imagery you need to have for the ozone, a wonderful thing, O3 ozone, that's a good thing. Down here in our troposphere where we're breathing, bad thing. Um, so when, and I don't know, I've never been, like I've been to LA, like the airport, but I've never been to like Los Angeles. I don't, Guys, I don't know. I don't know if I need to go there. Um, I don't know that my perspectives on life will be appreciated there. But I've heard rumor that when you go there, it does kind of bother you a little bit. Like when you start breathing that air and your lungs aren't used to it, that it does cause you to cough and carry on. The bad news is, is also here you get used to it, uh, which means that your body just gets accustomed to breathing badness. Um, but over time, that's got to affect your life expectancy. So, coughing, breathing problems, aggravating your lungs and your heart, that can't be good, reduces resistance to cold and pneumonia, which that is what we're experiencing now is how, um, my face is, just, okay. That's what we're experiencing now is the bilateral um, pneumonia. So if you know somebody um, with COVID-19, that's one of the earmarks is that they may have been diagnosed with bilateral pneumonia. So pneumonia can take a long time and they find that uh, when they do 
your chest x-rays. They can see pneumonia in your lungs. Irritations of the eye, nose, and throat. Damaging plants. Rubber in tires, fabrics, and paints. That's probably where it's coming from. So again, you just need to know the difference. It's still O3. It's just where is it found? All right, volatile organic compounds. These are called the VOCs, and these are organic compounds that exist in the gases in the atmosphere or gases that have evaporated from sources on Earth into the atmosphere. Hydrocarbons emitted by the leaves of many plants are considered volatile organic compounds. Methane, which, you know, we've all been told is the devil, is that greenhouse gas that's about 25 times more effective per molecule than CO2 is at warming the atmosphere. So when we talk about, you know, um, human interaction with our atmosphere and how that's affecting our climate change, but we're not going to talk about climate change on the AP exam for us. Methane is the culprit. And we know that our methane big producer is our cow farts and our cow belches. And is it the cow's fault? Of course not. It's, but what they're going to say is it's the human's fault for rearing the cows for the people. So that feeds back into the meatless Mondays. Um, other volatile organic compounds that we have benzenes that these are things that are used as industrial solvents which i i don't know anything about industrial solvents dry cleaning fluids various components of gas and plastics so this is just um if you're wanting to know what role you're playing in volatile organic compounds these are all the places so like i have a, a room that is carpeted i definitely use adhesives um, I use paints, uh, vinyl flooring. I feel like, it, uh, yes, we all have that. Air fresheners, I love. I Gasoline, I drive places. Cosmetics, hello. Um, so cleaning products, yes, like, uh, yes. Uh, we cook, yes. I don't dry clean, I'll tell you that right now. If I buy something that's dry clean only, now I'm going to, if, if, if I don't know that before I buy it, I'm just going to hope for the best. Uh, tobacco smoke, we're getting better for. I'm going to assume vaping falls under this. We're all corporates. Uh, culprits. <laughs> all right, lead. Now, the element PB is lead. So if you see PB, that means lead. And we used to have lead in paint. We don't anymore. Like, you could not buy lead paint, best paint, lead based paint if you tried. I'm assuming that it made a good adhesive. I don't, I, I don't I know any other reason why there would be lead based paint. But um, the problem is that in a lot of our older housing units where they can't afford to repaint, they may be dealing with the lead based problem. Um, babies were born with birth defects or, or acquired birth defects from exposure to lead-based paint. And some babies even ate paint chips. And you can imagine that's not good. So lead doesn't break down. It's an indestructible, potent neurotoxin. So neuro means low nug. Um, and it really does, like at first, it just lowers the IQ. And then ultimately, it leads to some pretty severe problems. Uh, Flint, Michigan, yes, that would be in their water. So, burning coal produces industrial smog. So, this is all about us, Kentucky. Um, it's rarely a problem in most of the more developed countries where coal and heavy oil are burned only in large power and industrial plants with reasonable good pollution uh, control. Every so many years, you hear a nice story about some young lady that says, this is where, is this where the clouds are made, right? Um, but we have the scrubbers and the, the buffers and all of those things that kind of help. The scary thing, I did not know this, but this, I mean, th these are the things that um, you just take for granted. Like when you see a smokestack, it never occurred to me, like, why is it so high? Um, I was like, because it is. Like, why would I even think about the height of a smokestack? Um, but 
then the next question is, why would it be so high? Like, why would you waste all of that material getting it so high up if it doesn't need to be so high up? Well, the answer is they're wanting to get the pollutants as far away from the industrialized area as possible. So a conspiracy theorist would be like, you know, they developed these super tall smokestacks so that when the powers that be come to look at their facility and take all of their readings, their pollutants have floated away. But then the, the rest of the story is, but then where does it fall? Well, it falls uh, at, in the surrounding towns, in the surrounding rural areas. So you don't see the smokestack. You know, it's dissipated in the air. You don't see the big brown cloud rolling towards your house. And yet, there it is. That's why they build the smokestack so high. It's so dilution, right? They're wanting to get it up in the air, and then it falls um, to towns nearby. So, photochemical versus industrial smog. I, you know, I was like, is there really a difference? And evidently there is. Um, so London is considered a gray smog and LA is considered a brown air smog. And I would say just basically what you're looking at there is the amount of nitric oxides versus some of the others. Oh, you guys have got to watch this. This is crazy. So China um, has 16 of the world's most polluted cities. Um, I may, let me see, let me see if I can do something here. I'm going to try. <laughs> oh, God. I, I can say what she's saying. I could be like your person. So, she's, so this is, this, look, this is a Chinese woman and she's riding her bike and she's like, oh, it's so smuggy in here. So this is what it really, like, he's standing outside. Oh, he says, you probably can see. So he's saying it's better than it was on the weekend. So when you're walking in this town, it's choking you. To walk outside and you're you can't see to drive. So three hundred is considered um, hazardous, and in Beijing it was over a thousand. Now, masks are a big conversation topic for all of us. Um, for all of us. And these kinds of masks that they have probably are reducing some of the bigger particulates that are in the air. But the smaller are going to come on through. But they're trying to do anything. And, you know, we also have to remember as this is, he's talking about um, how bad the air quality is and how people are upset about it. But remember, China is not a democracy. So even though they're upset, there's not a whole lot they can do about it. They don't have a say in what's happening. And, and, and the... I don't want to say free market, but the their ability to report on bad things is not always um, available to them. So it makes it very, very difficult to deal with. So that's uh, I just wanted you to see how bad it truly is. Um, sunlight plus cars equal photochemical smog. So are you... Um, are you responsible for photochemical smog? Of course you are. 
it is uh, we're all we're all responsible for us to a certain extent. So um, the options that we can do here, remember, on your AP exam, you never just want to say uh, the burning of fossil fuels, right? You want to say how you're bur what bu what fossil fuel you're burning, and then what are you going to do to fix it? So the really easy answers for these kinds of things are instead of getting up and driving to work. Like I drive to Davis County High School from Springbank. Now, there's a little side note, like, right, I take a little adventure and I drive out to Heritage Christian first. But when I no longer have to drive to Heritage Christian, I can just walk to work. And those are those little things that you could do that you want to put on your AP exam, take those little steps, flesh that answer out to reduce our emissions. Um, now, the other thing that you may not know about is the car. So the front of your car is pulled up to the back of another car. Well, the exhaust pipe is on the back of the other car. The front of your car is sucking the air, right, feeding it into your vehicle. So people in places like L.A. where they are stuck in traffic for so long they suffer from this because they're literally just pulling in car exhaust. And um, that's one of the things that they've talked about is how to handle all of the all of the car exhaust. And one of the things is we're making cars with better emissions. Uh, but with those better emissions, up goes the price tag. So uh, some of our less affluent people can't afford those new cars. So um, let's see. The nitrogen oxide is converted to this nitrogen dioxide, and then UV causes some of the nitrogen dioxide to react with the volatile organic compounds released, and then we end up with photochemical smog. Um, so this is not one of these cities. <laughs> I think I figured that out last year. Um, oh, sorry, Chloe is talking about... Sweden is developing a carbon dioxide bank that can hold enough carbon dioxide for a year. Okay, that's cool. There are, again, I think there is some new technology where um, there are machines that are sucking carbon dioxide up and helping. They're like photosynthetic machines that we also may have as an option here in our not-so-distant future. So, all modern cities have some photochemical smog, but if it is sunny, if it is warm and it is dry, you're going to have way more photochemical smog. Um, the water, right, so the humidity will pull those other particles down and help with the smog situation. According to a 1999 study, if there were 400 million uh, conventional gasoline-powered cars on the road in China by 2050, the resulting photochemical smog uh, would and could regularly cover the entire western Pacific Ocean extending to the U.S. And that's what we're seeing. That's that brown cloud that we're seeing all of those cars. So, five natural factors to help reduce outdoor air pollution. Particles heavier than air settle out as a result of gravitational attraction to the earth. So, um, the bigger particles are going to settle out. Uh, rain and snow always help clear the air. That's why the air feels smells different right after a good rain. Salty sea spray from the from the ocean washes out washes out many pollutants from the air that flows from the land and the ocean. Wind sweeps pollutants away and mixes with cleaner air and some pollutants are removed by chemical reactions. Eh, we're not going to get into that as much. So understand that a lot of these things are are the natural cycles that are happening without our intervention. Um, six other factors that can increase outdoor air pollution, urban buildings. So if you go to UK, they have created, and I'm going to say accidentally, this wind tunnel. It's around Patterson Office Tower. They call it POT. And you, I mean, there are so many videos, I'm sure, of people with their umbrellas turned inside out where this wind tunnel has just been created. Um, and that's pretty rare because a lot of the high rises are blocking the air. So remember, dilution is, is what we're going for. We want to dilute. We want to have the wind carry things away. And instead, because we have all these big buildings, it's slowing the airflow down. 
Um, hills and mountains reduce air. High temperature promote chemical reactions that form photochemical smogs. Emissions of VOCs from certain trees and plants in heavily wooded urban areas can play large roles in the formation of photochemical smog. This, number five, I need you to look at. So this is the grasshopper effect. It occurs when air pollutants are transported at high altitudes by evaporation and winds from tropical and temperate areas through the atmosphere to the Earth's polar areas. So it was one of those unexpected, I can hear Rosie, y'all, I'm sorry, um, effects where it's literally hopping to areas we didn't expect it. And then temperature inversion, layer of warm air can temporarily lay on top of cooler air, and then it stops it from rising up. All right, two types of areas are especially susceptible to prolonged temperature inversions. So I want you to look. I have literally tried to find like a great valley for you. Um, so if we have a town or a city located in a valley, then we have um, then we have what we call an inversion. So the clouds block much of the winter sunlight that causes the air to heat up and rise, and then the mountains block the wind. So it's kind of like stuck in a bowl there. Um, you also have cities with many motor vehicles in an area with a sunny climate, mountains on three sides, and an ocean on the fourth sides, and those mountains prevent the polluted air from being blown away. So these sound like very beautiful places, and I'm sure they are. However, thanks to their beauty, they're kind of being stuck in this inversion, right? Um, oh, good. We did it. I love it. Okay. So we've got through 18.1 and 18.2 today. We'll get through 18.3 tomorrow. I'm not going to do a vocab quiz tomorrow at all. Um, I feel like everybody was expecting 17. Um, is that what Salt Lake is like? I don't know. I've never been there. Uh, Caleb says, is that what, uh, that's what Salt Lake City is like. I, I'm sure it is. So, um, so no quiz tomorrow. You're just reading chapter 18. You're looking at those review questions, preparing for your AP exam, everything in appropriate bites. I'm going to take time here in a minute and look at your test grades, fix the test, um, encourage you guys to email me, uh, you know, whatever you need to do to talk about whatever we need to talk about. If you've not watched the Toad video, I feel like I've gone through and put everybody's grades in that have reported. If you have reported that you've watched it, like if you sent me an email that says you've watched it and I don't have your grade in, send me an email telling me that you've watched it um, so that I can get that in because those are free points. Like I'm trying to pad your guys' grades. So help me help you. Let me finish up with the AP conversation one more time. So you guys can go to AP Central. You will have your class code on your uh, Google Classroom page. Go get logged in there. And we did Unit 1, and there were questions about what am I going to do for grades for Unit 1? And the answer is, I don't know. I don't feel confident that all of you got into Unit 1 yet. So you're this week you're headed to Unit 2. We need to get to Unit 7 because those are the units that are going to be on the AP exam. Can you work ahead? Of course. Uh, can you do them again? Of course. I feel like I need to assign Unit 2. I may have assigned all seven of them. I do remember just hitting a bunch of buttons at one point. So you're wanting our pace wants to be at least a unit a week, right, getting to that AP exam, which is on May the 11th, I believe. And so that's your pacing, right? You're, ev you're marching ever forward. If you think you're going to cover all seven units in a day and a half, that's bad. Um, oh, dear. So, um, so AP exam is going to be 45 short answer questions is what they're calling them. 
And that sounds scary to me. I'll be honest with you. Um, I have faith in you guys. You're going to do great. And uh, you're going to you're going to pull this out. But it's going to it's not going to be the bird is blue. It's going to be a thought out answer. And they're going to try to keep you from being able to cheat. And, you know, you guys are going to do great. You all have put in the work and you're going to do great. But it's going to be 45 short answer questions. And I, I don't even know. I want to say 90 minutes. But I'm fearful to give you a time period because I'm fearful to give you a time period. So units 1 through 7, 45 short answer questions. Uh, no FRQs. They're all FRQs, right? No multiple choice questions. So that's where we're at with this. So the re- your assignment today is just read chapter 18, work on chapter 18 review questions. No quiz tomorrow. We will have a vocab quiz. Will not be tomorrow. Um, and then tomorrow we'll do 18-3. I hope you guys are doing well, staying well. Like I said, they've kicked me out of the school. I do not know the format of AP Hug, but I can ask Miss Agglehart. And does this chat stay OL? Um, look, I, maybe I'll just post it. Or maybe I'll tell Miss Agglehart to post it. There you go. Tell her to get up off her butt. And, oh, I'm just kidding. And she's doing good, guys. And, but I would think usually AP Human Geography and AP Environmental follow about the same format. So I would prepare to have that. They're just looking to give you guys a test that you can't just quickly Google search the answers. So I think what they're trying to do is they're trying to reward those of you who have taken the class and you've studied and you've done the work and that that includes you all. So you all are going to do great. Um, and I'm praying for you guys desperately. Um, this is just not ideal. I don't, I don't know how to do that, but I'll look into that. Um, but yeah, I'm praying for you guys, and I love you, and I miss you, and uh, seeing your little names pop out does really make me feel better, and uh, I just need you to all stay confident and stay plugged in with me. We can do this, all right? So I'm gonna, I'm gonna get out of here, and I'll see you tomorrow, 11 o'clock.